Welcome back to Reimagine 2020. I'm Yona Hockhauser, and today I'm glad to be joined by Lou Kerner, founder of Crypto Mondays. Lou, thanks for joining us. Hey, Yona, great to be here. Thanks for having me. No, no problem. Now, Lou, first of all, I think it's really awesome that we get to speak to you today because, you know, this is an educational forum where people are coming together to learn from one another, and you've really been big in that field with your Crypto Monday. Could you explain to our viewers who aren't familiar with it kind of what Crypto Monday is? Sure. So uh, when I saw the crypto light on June 29th, 2017, you know, I really think that crypto is the biggest thing to happen in the history of mankind. And I think it's, it's really infinite in what it can, uh, you know, how it can change the world. And so I think when everybody sees the crypto light, everybody sees something different uh, based on the prism at which they're looking at the world through based on their own unique life. Um, for me, um, the second company that I ran was called Bolt, an early social network. Uh, we were actually the largest social network in the world before MySpace peaked about 23 million monthly uniques. Um, and so I learned a long time ago about community uh, and about what an engaged community can accomplish. And so when I saw crypto, I really believed that community was at the center of crypto. And that's what made crypto different from everything that came before it. And that's really the opportunity is in harnessing the power of community. And um, uh, so, you know, I've done a lot of things focusing on building communities, uh, including my own Crypto Mondays is actually a meetup. I was an early investor uh, in meetup. And so I've known for a long time about the magic of meetup. You know, you start a meetup and the people you want to uh, you, you know, you, you want to come kind of magically disappear. So we started Crypto Mondays on January 8th, 2018, uh, which coincidentally is still the peak market cap day in crypto's history. Coinc <laughs> Coincidence? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe not. Time will tell. <laughs> we had 300 people at the first one. We had 350 people at the second one. Uh, and it was so exciting and we thought that it was so helpful for the community that we decided to blow it out around the world. Uh, Los Angeles was the second Crypto Mondays, uh, started two weeks later. Uh, today there have been uh, Crypto Mondays in 57 cities around the world. Wow. And to a large degree, the success is based on the fact that it's fully decentralized. So everybody who runs a Crypto Monday gets to run the Crypto Monday in their city that they want, optimizing it you know, for, you know, the, the founders of that Crypto Monday and for that community. Uh, and so they really have ownership to, to make it into to, to what they want. Now, how does a Crypto Monday meetup look like? Is it, is it like a formal gathering with, hey, you know, Mr. A is speaking from this hour to this hour? Or is it more of a, you know, coffee and biscuits, let's all stand around and exchange ideas? Sure. So again, Every Crypto Monday is different. It's a reflection of the people running the Crypto Mondays in that city. Um, for when we started New York, I started the meetup that I wanted to start, which was no content, just people coming and who are as passionate about crypto as I am and coming and sharing ideas. Um, and I think it was you know, really powerful, very successful in the early days. But what we saw was is, um, you know, the price was going down um, and so, you know, the number of people coming to the Crypto Mondays was coming down and we looked around at the Crypto Mondays uh, around the world. What we saw was the Crypto Mondays that had content uh, were actually growing, whereas the Crypto Mondays like ours that weren't were declining. So we decided, you know, that, that we, you know, wanted to get as big of the community to come as we wanted. So after about a year, we started having content as well. So in New York, we have 30 minutes of uh, fireside chat, 20 minutes of Q&A from me, 10 from the audience. And that still leaves plenty of time both before and after for what I think is the real value, which is the community members yapping with each other. For sure. Now, you know, like, like everything else, I'm sure COVID-19 pandemic has, has touched and affected Crypto <laughs> Mondays. You guys are built off of meetups. How do you do meetups, you know, in the age of a, of a pandemic? Sure. So what happened very quickly, obviously, is, you know, we saw tons and tons of, of people moving their things to Zoom and all kinds of people, too, who weren't doing anything before having Zoom meetings. Um, and Zoom meetings are great. Um, but, you know, we wanted to maybe do something a little different. So in New York, we moved uh, our meetup to uh, VR. <laughs> um, and so you know, the good and the bad, the good is VR is amazing. 
uh, in my view, if you have a spectrum and on one end is real life and on the other end is Zoom, VR actually is, it feels closer to real life to me than it does to, to, to Zoom. So it really feels like you're in the room and you're interacting with people and you can see their hands moving and their, yeah, and, and um, you, know, you can listen to the main speakers, you can go off to a side room and have your own dialogue. Um, and, and so that's been terrific. The downside is a tiny percentage of the world actually has VR headsets today. Um, so, uh, uh, so we don't get a, a huge audience, but the audience continues to build over time. I think, you know, when we look back at, at COVID-19, I think what we'll find is that it didn't necessarily break a lot of new things or, or even start a lot of new things because of it, but it just accelerated trends that were already in process. And certainly the VR trend, I think is gonna be a great example. I think it was growing, but with VR, it's gonna dramatically, I'm sorry, with COVID, it's gonna dramatically accelerate that. Mm, for sure. Now, you know, as we saw, uh, you know, with reaction to COVID-19, it hit really hard particular industries. You know, airline industries are really hit hard. You know, uh, hospitality, like hotels, have been, have been decimated. On the flip side, a lot of industries have been actually gotten a boost. You know, Zoom and other work from home type of uh, solutions have gotten a real kick from, from kind of this lockdown world that we live in today. Where do you feel that in general, I mean, obviously it's a very, very broad industry, but that the blockchain and crypto industry, where does that fall on that spectrum? Because you know, they already are decentralized. They already are used to kind of working without you know, a, a, a boss standing over their shoulder. Where do you see that the, the crypto sphere sits on that spectrum? Sure, well, the statistics we've seen is that you know, um, uh, you know, adoption of all new things is, is slower than people think. Uh, uh, e-commerce was, uh, which started, let's say Amazon started in 94. So, you know, you know more than 25 years old, e-commerce had gotten to about 12% of, of market share of retail uh, in the U.S. Um, prior to the pandemic. And uh, it, it picked up, you know, about 8% of retail sales. So it got about the last 10 years in three months. Um, so again, it's just accelerating trends that were already continuing. Obviously, digital is a long-term trend you know, that, that this significantly accelerated. And I think crypto falls into that same bucket. You know, I think we're starting to see activities now around things like DeFi at levels that we've never seen before. Uh, and so you know, I really believe that um, you know, we'll look back on DeFi and look back at, at this period of time as really kind of that, you know, and I just wrote a post to this effect, the Netscape moment. Because it was when the Netscape browser was introduced that we had, um, you know, in the following three months, the number of internet sites went from 600 to 10,000. Uh, a few months later, uh, uh, we saw Netscape IPO at a $2.9 billion value less than two years after they had started, which back in those days was unheard of. And that really was the start of a five-year incredibly massive, you know, internet bull market. And I think that we're starting to see that same impact happening in crypto today. You know, well, I'm happy you brought that up because for those who don't know, me and you have been speaking for, for over a year now uh, on these interviews, you know, about Block TV and may it rest in peace. But uh, you've, been, you've been yelling at the top of your lungs about the wonders of DeFi for so long, way before, you know, it was mainstream or, or, or a thing in the crypto sphere. Uh, and it seems like people are finally starting to wake up. You're calling it the Netscape moment right now. Uh, in your view, how does it feel now to see how well DeFi is doing and, and getting the respect that it deserves? Well, look, you know, I, I'm not really a, a, a futurist, a visionary. <laughs> Ooh, what, I'm an analyst. And so, you know, what, what I saw, um, you know, really, you know, in, in Q4 last year was, was the start of these new things. Um, that we're starting to get usage, but you could also see that part of what was driving it was the composability. So every new thing that was built, they were like Legos. You could put them on top and mix and match and write a few lines of code, you know, and take these different Legos that already exist and create something totally new. So it, it, it appeared obvious to me, and really I think anybody who was paying attention, that this was going to drive incredible innovation at a pace that we had never seen before. And so that's what we're seeing today is the fruit of all that innovation, the fruit of putting those Legos together. You know, uh, uh, you know, we're, we saw, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, something that within 24 hours, a new thing, yams, <laughs> get $500 million of, of assets um, within 24 hours, right? That's an incredible pace relative to, you know, it took, you know, Maker, you know, I think 18 months uh, uh, to get to that level as opposed to 24 hours. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the really the start, and it's still tiny. It's still infinitesimally small. It still rounds to zero. But for those of us in the industry day to day, it's incredible. Yeah, like you mentioned, it is just at its infancy. But but so far, what is your what is your favorite DeFi project uh, that you've seen so far that, that you have the biggest hope for? You might not call yourself a visionary. But I mean, I, I, through the time I've known you, you've foreseen and called everything correctly. So what, what do you see? What is your favorite DeFi product? Well, today, what I'm most excited about, you know, and, and obviously we still have a challenge with onboarding people. We still have a challenge, obviously, as amazing as DeFi is, these, you know, these things that are getting people in the industry excited. It's still very complex. And so, you know, in, in my view, the most exciting thing going on in DeFi is stable coins because stable coins and, and to some degree you know you can peg a stable coin to anything it can be pegged to to gold or or to oil um you know any currency but what's really exciting to me is the stable coins that are pegged to the dollar um because everybody knows the dollar everybody understands what a digital dollar is we all use digital dollars every day you know whether we use credit cards or whether we use you know we pay um uh, uh and so now, you know, up until very recently, in order to create dollars, you needed to be either uh, the, the U.S. government or a bank. And actually banks uh, uh, create the, the significant majority of dollars. But now anybody uh, increasingly can create dollars. Um, you know, what Maker is doing I, you know, and, and started, I think, is incredible, right? You can take any asset. Well, not any asset, but, you know, it started with ETH and now it's growing and growing. And, and you can create dollars. And that's incredible. It's a $30 trillion market in round figures. It's growing like this, um, you know, because people all around the world want dollars. Um, you know, as, you know, as, as horrible as the dollar is, in my view, in terms of holding value, um, you know, it, uh, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And the dollar still today, um, you know, is king. I think, you know, the, the, the wand looks like it's going to replace it. And the wand's going to come out with their own, you know, they already have their own central bank digital currency uh, in in China, um, and, you know, and, and it's in beta, and they're going to roll it out around the world. And I think whether it's you know the, the you know China's central bank digital currency, Libra, Maker, you know, or any one of these new emerging stable coins um, that are pegged to the dollar, uh, you know, I think we're going to you know, or the yuan, you know, I think we're going to start to see people easily getting on boarded using these new things and then opening up their minds, you know, kind of like how AOL got people to, to go online and then that enabled them to open the world up to the internet um, instead of that walled garden. And I think central bank digital currencies are that same thing. To some degree, they're kind of walled gardens, but once you have a digital wallet, kind of like once you're online, then, oh my God, anything's possible. Right, and I and, and know, listen, DeFi couldn't work without stable coins uh, for the most part. I think that's pretty clear. And, and stable coins, as you mentioned, a lot of pros, and we're gonna get to that. I, I wanna focus a, a little second on a, on a con or a potential con here. In your view, you know, kind of the promise of cryptocurrencies was kind of getting, taking the power away from these governments, you know, from the ability to print endless money, especially now we see it in response to the coronavirus. You know, governments are just printing crazy stimulus printing dollars at, at record rates, isn't there an issue with, with these stable coins that are pegged directly to a US dollar? Doesn't that still put that stable coin under a certain control of the US government in terms of its, of its value relative to something that's disconnected? Yeah, no, look, undoubtedly you're exactly right. But again, going back to the AOL analogy, right? You know, the, the idea it wasn't get, to get people to a walled garden but you need to get people online for them to get to the internet. And so, you know, what a CBDC will do is it will get people comfortable with a digital wallet, right? Get people comfortable with digital assets sitting in their digital wallet. And once they get that, then their eyes are open to the world of possibilities, right? Then 
they can go and they, it's much easier for them to buy Bitcoin once they have a digital wallet, once they open their eyes to, to the fact that even their, you know, their, their, whether it's the one or the dollar, um, that they lose value over time as opposed to Bitcoin or other stores of values or other cryptocurrencies that have all kinds of other utility. Mm -hmm. You know, like there is a wide range of stable coins, even just ones that are pegged to the dollar. There are many different ways of doing it. You know, there is Tether, then there's USD, uh, USDC. I mean, in your view, uh, you know, the, the point, I mean, I, I could ask you this, I guess, as an opinion, but I would say the point of a stable coin uh, you know, its main purpose is, is something that you could trust, is that it, its price is not volatile and you could trust that its value will remain stable, hence its name. In your view, which stable coin actually pulls that off the best? Which stable coin, because uh, there is no CBDC yet as, as much as, as we hope for it, which until then, which is a stable coin to trust? Sure. Well, so, you know, again, you've got to look at this holistically, right? Because there are a lot of different elements that stable coins have besides just their, their, their peg. Um, so today I think the, 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 the stable coin that holds its peg best uh, is, you know, and that's at scale today is USDC. USDC, uh, uh, it's a partnership between Circle uh, and Coinbase and effectively you send them a dollar and then they can mint a, uh, uh, a USDC they get audited all the time, so you can see that they actually have, you know, more money in the bank than there are USDCs outstanding. If you want to turn them in, you can get a dollar. Obviously, nobody buys these, so they can turn them in for a dollar. Um, but you know, that's helped the USDC, you know, effectively, you know, hold that uh, a dollar peg really closely. What you though lose with USDC, obviously, you know, one is is you know, it's it is centralized. So, you know, the government can come in, the government can say, actually, USDC, we don't like what you're doing. They can go in, they can seize all the money. They, you know, uh, it's completely transparent to the government. So, um, so you don't have the privacy that you have in other coins like DAI, like Maker's DAI, um, which is, you know, really by a wide margin, kind of the most functional decentralized uh, currency today at scale. But DAI struggles the way that it's set to hold its peg. Um, and so that doesn't make it very functional for, um, you know, for traders, uh, you know, who want to know that they can buy and sell, you know, and that it's going to be a very tight range. Um, and that's, you know, and, and what's interesting about Tether, what's amazing about Tether is that, you know, they said when they launched that they were going to have a dollar for every, you know, in the bank for every Tether that they minted. And then the New York State did not. It turns out they only had 75 cents on the dollar and nobody cared. <laughs> Why didn't anybody care? Because nobody was getting it to turn it in for a dollar. People were getting it because they believed that the next guy would take it for a dollar. The next guy is still taking it for a dollar. So, you know, one of the things that you learn is when you're in the industry is, you know, that, that you know, and this is about everything in life as well, but that things work until they don't. So today Tether is working and it could work another day, week, month, 100 years, nobody has any idea, you know, but, um, you know, what, what I'm most excited about is things, you know, and by the way, Tether are also obviously centralized. What I'm most excited about is we're getting this emergence of stable coins like Peg Network, um, which, you know, is both decentralized and private and able, you know, scalable and able to hold the, the, the peg. And I think that's the, 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 the next wave uh, of stable coins that we're going to see. We'll have all of those properties. And then we'll get all kinds of new properties that we're not even thinking about that's going to blow people's minds. I mean, already looking at the DeFi space, it blows my mind because unlike you, I am not an analyst. You come from the, the Wall Street world and you kind of have a better understanding of these very complex financial instruments. You know, when, when I take a look at DeFi and, and yield farming and, and kind of how people are taking these tools and utilizing it to make these percentages, make the money and, and trying to you know, gain value from it. it. It seems like a very high barrier of entry. It seems like very complex to understand. Um, is DeFi where it's at in your view? I mean, I, I, it, from my point of view, DeFi, the promise of DeFi is kind of opening up the power of financial instruments to everyone instead of centralizing it as it has historically been. Uh, do you feel that DeFi is kind of 
in some way replicating the traditional financial system in that it's still geared towards creating value for the people who understand its complexities and understand how to get that arbitrage, how to, how to make that extra percentage on the complex instruments? Sure, I think you're exactly right. I think today it's still very complex. I think the things that people are getting excited about, um, you know, while it has found product market fit, you know, amongst this group of people, um, I, I think DeFi as it is now, the products that people are excited about now, those aren't mass market, market products. They're just far, far, far too complicated. Um, and, um, but, but what we're seeing though is is the emergence of these tools that again, you're gonna be able to have all kinds of different products. You know, one of the things that I'm most excited about um, is a, a delegated um, a credit. So in other words, you know, I can, you know, lock up my ETH and, and then I have credit. And then if I want to, I can take that credit that I have, um, you know, to, to get DAI or some other stable coin um, and I can take that and I can delegate it to somebody else. And now I can get an interest rate um, from, from that person. And maybe that person has a credit card, you know, that they're paying 20% on, but now they can pay me 10%. So they're getting cut in half and I can get 10%, uh, you know, as opposed to, you know, 0.1% that I can get in the bank. Um, and maybe, you know, I won't even have to know that person, but I'll just know some kind of credit score that the DeFi community will create around, you know, uh, uh, either, you know, it could be their credit history, which is how it works now, but also it could be some kind of social graph, right? I might not know that person, but I know 10 other people and maybe each one of those 10 people will uh, stake something to, to give credit to that person. And maybe all can then share part of my 10% with those people um, and everybody can win. Um, outside of the you know traditional banking system, where generally the only person who wins there is the bank. Right. I mean, for sure. And except, and it kind of when when I hear talk like that, it gets me very excited because it opens up the realms of possibility to a wide range of people and a much larger ranges of options and, and possibilities to all these people. But what scares me is that these are very uh, powerful tools that enable an immense growth. But at the same time, if people uh, either one, don't understand them properly, or two, there are people who want to uh, take advantage of the system. You know, so let's look back at the 2008 financial uh, crisis, the traditional market financial crisis, uh, you know, subprime mortgages and kind of packaging complex instruments uh, you know, to, to, to try to gain a profit and, and pass the buck along. Uh, is, is there not a, a fear here that, you know, this is such an exciting new technology um, that enables, like you said, I could, I could delegate credit, but, but doesn't, doesn't that then allow for, for, for a, a much easier kind of bubble to, to be built here, you know, without the oversight, without the regulation? Sure. A few things. Well, you know, one, I have a word that I use to describe the tendency of markets to become bubbles and crash and become bubbles again. I call that capitalism because that's what it does. Right. And so the question is, you know, but you know, capitalism is a very broad term. What kind of capitalism do you want to, um, actually practice, right? In the United States, we practice a, a form of capitalism that's really capitalism for 99% and socialism for the 1%, right? Because the government will come and bail you out if you're, you know, a billionaire, you're a bank. Um, it, you know, it doesn't really bail you out if you're the average person. Um, and and the, the government also has rules, right? And tells the banks, okay, here are the rules. Um, but, you know, you don't even know if the rules are being followed. Right. And there's, you know, there's enforcement of the rules, but the enforcement, you know, uh, you know, the rules is obviously very haphazard. The most exciting thing to me about crypto in general are the rules are hard coded. Now, in the early days of DeFi, it's like the early days of flying planes, right? In the early days of flying planes, there were, there were plane crashes. Um, and, and it could be because of malicious behavior. Um, you know, but it, it doesn't even matter if it's because of malicious behavior or not, it's a plane crash. And every time that there was a plane crash, there'd be an investigation, why did the plane crash? And they'd fix it so that hopefully it wouldn't crash for that same reason again. And then there was another plane crash and they fixed that reason. And then today, there really are no more plane crashes, right? I mean, it, it, it's much safer to be in a plane than it is to be in a car. And we're going to get that same way with DeFi. It's going to be much safer to be in a DeFi protocol than it is to be in the real world. 
because you know we will have fixed the you know the the most plane crashes, uh, and you can't break the rules. We're in the real world. Um, and, you know, you don't have to pay attention to the rules, right? Bernie Madoff didn't pay attention to the rules, right? And nobody caught him for 20 years, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, Trump didn't pay, you know, it'll come out, my belief is, right, that, you know, he's massively defrauded the system for, you know, 40 years. He was incredibly good at it, so good at it, he became president. <laughs> yeah. So, so do, do, on that note, do you see, I mean, DeFi is, is, because of its nature being decentralized, it makes it tough to regulate do you foresee, you know, the 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 U.S. government, um, and, and and with it, you know, it's 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 backed by the traditional markets, by the traditional big banks, and obviously it's all interconnected. Uh, the politicians and, and 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 the people who have money, do you see them, you know, kind of uh, putting in regulation to kind of stifle DeFi, and, and and are they even able to because of the nature, the decentralized nature of DeFi? Sure. So look, I mean, the government and the lawmakers are largely solving for themselves. That's what they do. So I don't even know what it is they're trying to accomplish. I, you know, uh, uh, what I do know is, is, is that regulators regulate. That's what they do. Um, and you know, the US in particular, um, you know, obviously gets massive benefits from the dollar being the effectively global reserve currency. Um, and so the, the US government, my guess is gonna do a lot of things to protect it. Right when it finds out and opens its eyes and it sees that its monopoly on um, producing dollars is at risk because now anybody can produce a dollar, um, I think they're going to come down against that. You know now you know they allow banks to produce dollars, but they closely regulate that. Um, you know, but I think the genie is out of the bottle. Right, this is happening, um, and you know I think in some ways it'll be like you know gambling on the internet. Right, the 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 you know, the US government was able to stop people from doing it in the United States, was able to arrest people from the United States, was able to go after the credit card carriers and get them to stop allowing people in the United States to work with these sites. So there are a bunch of levers that the US government can pull to, to slow the growth of it, to slow the use of it in the United States. But what we're gonna get increasingly is regulatory arbitrage. We're gonna see other areas that allow this, other countries that not only allow it, but embrace it and leverage it, like we're seeing Asia doing, like we're seeing China doing with their central bank digital currency. And those countries that, that, that do are gonna see massive benefit from it because this is the future. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I just saw you know, an incredible graph that showed that China's payments uh, to uh, uh, Russia for buying Russia goods, um, they now are settling more of that in euros. It used to be almost 100% dollars. And now it's more euros than dollars. The world is de-dollarizing. The world doesn't want to be hostage, particularly, you know, particularly China, but every country in the world doesn't want to be hostage to the United States. Um, and, and you know, and we're going to see de-dollarization you know, continue. So the U.S. government's going to do what it does. Every government's going to do what it does. But, you know, people like you and me are, you know, and increasingly everybody else are going to move if they can to those geographies that are, that, that are enabling this because those are the ones that are going to be growing. For sure. Now, uh, you know, switching gears for a second, you, know, you, you originally come from Wall Street, traditional finance, you know, institutional investing. I'm sure you still have your finger on the pulse there and, and you're well connected. Can you share how, how you know, institutional funds and institutional investors are, are now looking into crypto uh, in response to you know, the, the, the Fed's the fiscal policies and the government's fiscal policies in response to the corona? Sure. Um, well, you know, I, I think that for traditional Wall Street, you know, they get involved when they can make money. And today, this is such a tiny, tiny little industry. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a, would be a rounding error to a Goldman Sachs or a JP Morgan um, to you know, get deeply involved at, at, at this point. And there are so many regulatory uncertainties um, you know, that uh, uh, you know, they'll make investments. JP Morgan's making an investment into consensus, uh, uh, which is quite exciting. Um, so, you know, they, I think, you know, are going to do what they do, which is keep their finger on the pulse, keep an eye on it, right? They're not idiots. They 
know that this is the future if they have their eyes open. Um, but the futures, you know, from their standpoint, not happening today or tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I think the current bull market to some degree was set off by the uh, office of the controller of the currency in the U.S. when they said that they're going to allow banks to custody Bitcoin um, and other cryptocurrencies. Um, that was a big step forward. You know, it, I'm personally less concerned with what the regulators do because this is happening regardless of what the regulators do. But I also appreciate that the, the more regulators enable this, the faster it'll happen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like you mentioned that, that the, the, the control is allowing banks to, to, to custody. I'm assuming that, that these steps forward are more geared towards Bitcoin and, and possibly Ethereum, less so, you know, so-called smaller altcoins, right? The institutions that even are willing to get involved in this, they're, they're more looking at, at Bitcoin and Ethereum or, or, the, or are there light, is the light switch turned on to this as a technology? And so they're more actually willing to look at smaller things. Uh, uh, and all coins. Again, I think you're right. Today, it's the larger coins, um, and they, you know, the coins, you know, have to cryptocurrencies, you know, have to get individually approved. I think there were eight or ten um, that were approved in in the first batch, and my guess it'll be more and more and more. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think that you'll see banks, uh, you know, some progressive banks. Uh, start to get involved. We're already seeing banks outside of the U.S. Um, you know, get very actively involved. Uh, uh, there's a, a bank in Liechtenstein, uh, Bank Frick, um, and they've got a rapidly growing stablecoin as a service product so that people can leverage stablecoins to pay their vendors, pay their employees. So, you know, we're seeing banks outside of the U.S. still, though, you know, small banks um, generally, but, you know, that are embracing it and leveraging it and, and building businesses. You know, uh, earlier this week, or I guess maybe at this point last week, uh, MicroStrategy, uh, you know, the first publicly traded a company on the NASDAQ, they announced they're moving $250 million of their capital into Bitcoin. Uh, is, is this, is this, a, uh, is this a, 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 a noteworthy event? Is this kind of the first push, you know, the first publicly traded company that, okay, they did it, their shareholders didn't go, you know, burn the building down, uh, are other publicly traded companies looking at this and saying, okay, they dip their feet in. Now this gives us permission, at least in the shareholders' eyes, to start also making kind of these alternative moves? You know, I, I, it's a great question. Um, it, it, for me, it's, it's, it's hard to put it into context because obviously Bitcoin is still, you know, very um, volatile. And so... You know, if I invested in a company, you know, probably I invested, you know, because, you know, I like their core business, what they're doing, and I want them investing in their core business. So I'm not, I, you know, micro strategies, core business is not investing in cryptocurrencies. So uh, for me, it doesn't make it more exciting to invest uh, uh, in, in micro strategy. Um, are other companies going to embrace that? Um, I struggle to see a lot of other companies embrace that. You know, I think if, you know, the price of Bitcoin doubles, you know, and they make money, are other people, sure, everybody rushes to, you know, what they think is easy money. And, but, you know, that's obviously the, you know, the time when everybody thinks it's easy money, that it's not easy money. And if Bitcoin halves, then everybody will laugh at that guy as an idiot. Um, so, you know, it, it's hard to know in context the impact that something like this will have, you know, again, you know, for me, I'm, I, I tend to focus more on, you know, what are the innovations, the real innovations that are happening? I think that's, you know, what's going to drive this market. What are people actually using? What is going up and to the right? Um, uh, that, you know, ultimately, I think when we look back, you know, those are the things that we're going to look back and say, yeah, that's, that's what really made the market. Um, you know, uh, uh, become, you know, uh, you know, get mass adoption. For sure. Now, uh, you know, before we, you know, we spoke about your, your heavy involvement in, in the, you know, the blockchain community with Crypto Mondays and, and you also, you write tons of crypto, uh, you know, articles and, and posts and uh, especially on Medium and you host various interviews as well. Uh, you know, there are many students watching this right now and, and our goal here with this whole Reimagine 2020 thing is to kind of show the future developers of the world, you know, computer science students, 
and, and you know, and, and all the youth who are interested um, about getting, who are interested in getting in blockchain, uh, wh where do you stand on blockchain and education uh, right now, whether it be formal or informal? Is the, is the education there available for those who want to learn? Sure. I mean, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of education out there. You know, I, you know, the, the, the writing and the work that I do, quite honestly, um, you know, I'm teaching myself. Uh, uh, William Faulkner has a great quote. Uh, I don't know what I think of anything until I read what I've written about it. You know, that's me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I host a lot of webinars, you know, and I have people on that I want to learn from who are doing super interesting things that I want to learn about. Um, you know, but there are lots of organizations, um, you know, like Ben, um, you know, the Blockchain Education Network, you know, that's on hundreds of campuses uh, uh, around the world, um, you know, that provides lots of material to help educate people. Um, you know, there are the Bitcoin centers, you know, in New York and in uh, uh, Miami that are doing nothing but educating people. You know, Andreas Antopoulos, you know, has been educating people about crypto for, for, for years. Um, and so, you know, in, in every newsletter that I put out, uh, I put a link to Medium uh, uh, ranks the top 50 most influential people across uh, uh, more than 100 different categories, including crypto. And I put a link, you know, if you want to learn about crypto, follow these 50 people. Every day you'll get an email with stuff that they wrote. And, and some of these people will, will speak to you. Most probably won't. But the idea is to find people who are talking about it in a way and teaching it in a way that, that resonates with you. You know, but ultimately, you know, longer term, um, you know, the idea is, is for us to build products leveraging this technology that don't take education, right? I mean, you know, I didn't go to school to learn how to use my cell phone, right? I don't even know how my cell phone works. I don't care how my cell phone works. All I know is I can pick it up, I can hit a couple buttons, and I can get massive value, right? And that's, you know, the inexorable march that crypto is on. I don't know whether a week, a month, 10 years away from getting there, but we're on, you know, we're on our way. We're going to get there. Um, and you know, the, the sooner, the better. Well, I mean, that, I think that's an interesting point because you, just, you keep on mentioning, you, you always look at innovation. You're interested in what kind of innovation is happening in the field. Uh, but at, at the same time, you know, uh, like you mentioned, until it's as easy to use as your cell phone, you know, you're not, it's going to be very, very tough to onboard anybody who isn't an early adopter, who isn't like you said, saw the light quote unquote. So do you feel, I mean, Obviously, you need, to, you need to move forwards. You need to get the innovation. But how much or, or do you think that there is not enough effort and in, in, in focus and in, uh, in funds put into in the, in the crypto sphere, in blockchain, in DeFi, into actually not just pushing the technology forwards, but also uh, making, fixing the UI, fixing the UX, and, 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 and making the technology that we currently have easier to use for the everyday person? Sure. Well, that's the great thing about capitalism, right? That's, that's what capitalism should solve for. Um, and there's, you know, I think, you know, massive rewards for the people who are able to, to figure that out. So I think lots and lots and lots of people are, are working on that. Um, you know, it goes to show the complexity of the problem. But the thing that gives me the most confidence is, you know, every day you see, you know, people are leaving Goldman Sachs or McKinsey and, and coming to crypto because they're seeing the, the, the crypto light. And so we really have, you know, so many incredibly brilliant people working and solving, you know, on solving these problems. It's unimaginable that they're not going to be solved. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and of course, we're getting, you're, like, like you mentioned, we're getting tons of the people from the traditional markets to see the light. They're coming, they're building up crypto as well. Uh, before, when I asked you about institutions coming in and investing in crypto and, and using these DeFi products, and you said it was just a small drop in the pond, but, but what happens when it is no longer that small drop? What happens you know, if, if it continues at this current pace, liquidity continues to explode and expand, and, and there's more uh, advanced and secure tools? What happens when the traditional banking and the traditional financial uh, you know, big, big giant players like JP Morgan, like Goldman Sachs, what happens when they enter DeFi, when they actually take these tools? Does it, does it ruin DeFi or does it actually uh, increase the, the scale and liquidity to the point where now DeFi is more decentralized and more powerful than ever? Sure. 
Great question. Obviously, nobody knows the answer to that. I think if you look back on the history of financial products, right, you know, the innovations, you know, uh, some of them, let's say junk bonds, brand new asset class, you know, all the investment banks said, we'd never do it. It's trash. Um, and they saw uh, uh, Drexel Burnham start to make a lot of money. And so they all went into it. And today, 40 years later, junk bonds are just like every other asset class. Um, and, and what the, you know, what the traditional players are, are really good at, too, is leveraging regulators, right? So getting the regulators to make it difficult for the competitors to, to, to compete. You know, on the other hand, you know, we're seeing, you know, a lot of upstarts, obviously, in, in fintech, um, you know, like a square come out and be able to really effectively compete uh, against their traditional uh, incumbents. And, you know, it's my guess that we're going to see a mix that, you know, Goldman Sachs isn't going away. Goldman Sachs has lots and lots of incredibly smart people still there. So the traditional uh, uh, financial institutions aren't going away, right? The Amazon's been here 25 years, um, you know, and you didn't see the traditional retailers fall away at first. Now you're starting to see more and more and more of them you know, falling, you know, again, we're seeing a significant acceleration of everything that was already going on, right? We've had more retailers uh, declare bankruptcy in the U.S., you know, in the last number of months than we have in the last number of years. Um, so it's accelerating everything, you know. So, you know, it's my guess that the people early on who are going to make the biggest impact are the people who don't ask permission. Because if you ask permission, the answer is no, right? Libra asked permission and they were told no, right? And so Maker didn't ask permission and now they're out there doing their thing and growing. At some point, is the US government gonna come after them? Probably what's gonna be the impact? Well, the people in the US, you know, the impact could be really significant. Same thing as the impact for the people who are running, you know, uh, online poker sites in the US. They were arrested and thrown in jail, right, for helping people play poker. <laughs> so yeah. imagine what they're going to do that, you know, to the people who are helping other people mint dollars, right? Um, so, you know, is that they come in? You know, I, I, I think so. I think I might have gotten a little off track, you know, but, you know, the traditional financial guys are going to want that, right? They're going to want the US government to go after their competitors. And, you know, because they're still going to be Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, they're still going to be regulated. So, you know, to some degree, they're disadvantaged, right, if the U.S. government doesn't go after the people who are unregulated and the people who aren't, you know, now USDC circle, they're regulated, they're paying attention. But as a result, you know, they're, they're not private, they're not decentralized, they're not solving a lot of the problems. Um, you know, I think most people today, you and I care about these things, 99.9% .9 of the people don't really care about it. They think, oh, if I'm not doing anything wrong, I don't have to worry, right? Well, mm -hmm. that's, uh, you, know, you have that view till you don't. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, well, I know you're busy. Last question before I let you go. What would you say to a, a student or a newcomer to uh, DeFi that, that saw this interview, got very excited about you know, all the potential tools and especially today with interest rates being essentially nothing, zero in the traditional markets, what would you say to someone if they want to kind of dip their feet into DeFi? You know, they want to, they want to put a little bit of money in sort of some sort of DeFi, uh, you know, interest, uh, you know, kind of banking or kind of DeFi into some DeFi investment. How would someone dip their toe into DeFi uh, and try it out for the first time? Yeah, I, I come back to go, go learn about it. Go, go read, you know, folks on Medium, um, you know, DeFi Dad. Um, if you go to Twitter, I think you know, he does all these amazing videos to help people understand how to get involved. And, and uh, uh, you know, he does talk about the risks, right? I mean, there are lots of risks. There are going to be lots of, of, of plane crashes. Um, and, you know, but it's educating yourself. It's about understanding. And you know, the more that you understand, the more you'll be able to figure out which of these applications are right for you where the risk reward is appropriate, right? There's, I'm a believer, there's no free lunch. <laughs> exactly. So if you're getting a free lunch, you know, if you're getting outsized rewards, you're, you're probably taking, you know, outsized risk and maybe you're fine with that, 
but you should understand what those risks are. I think, you know, with a lot of things, yams, right? You know, started unaudited, you know, contracts, you know, and, and it turns out that there was a mistake, right? Um, you know, who knew, right? So, you know, you, you're taking risks. Um, you know, for me personally, I don't like taking risks I don't understand. Um, but, you know, yeah, what I do think is we should live in a world where people can take whatever risks that they want to take. And so, you know, go educate yourself. I think at the end of the day, I think the ROI, the return on investment, on time spent educating yourself in this space is the best ROI you're going to get in your life. Well, Nalu, you're a very busy man. I appreciate you taking the time to educate everyone who's watching this video. Lou Kerner of Crypto Monies, thank you so much for joining us. And for, for all our viewers at Reimagine 2020, I'm Yona Hockhauser. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Yona, and thanks for everything you do for the community as well.